I'd just like to welcome um, Scott to the stage. Thanks. Cool. Hey, um, great to see you all here. I'll just, I'm going to be using Prezi today, and I think it actually can cause nausea. So um, just a warning there. Right, here we go. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a, a story about ad scale and our experience over the past year. So as you might have heard, we're five years old, uh, and in that time we've uh, been pretty passionate about adopting agile methodologies and uh, applying them to our work. So the business is located in Munich in Germany. We're an online advertising marketplace. We're uh, the second largest online advertising marketplace in Germany, and we compete directly with Google. And so over five years, we've built that up uh, through the rigorous <laughs> application of uh, agile methodologies to um, you know, our current level of success. And I really does think it shows the depth of talent we have in Canterbury. Um, and about a year ago, uh, we were facing some pretty significant decisions we had to make around our company in that uh, there was a pressing need for more structure. We had grown to 30 people, we had three scrum teams, uh, and we needed to figure out how do we actually improve how we make decisions and improve coordination around how we do things. Um, so this is kind of our story around that, and uh, the choice to rather than... Uh, create a traditional management structure, because up to that point our company had been completely flat. We'd had our, our benevolent, benevolent and visionary leader Manfred there uh, uh, leading us for those five years. And we had to decide what we needed to do in regard to structure to allow us to grow to the next level, essentially. Uh, so that's the story I want to talk to you about today, but first I'm going to talk to you a bit about our history. So. In the beginning, five years ago, there was nothing. Uh, it's not quite true because there was an idea, some German investors, and Manfred. There he is. And he's a lot more attractive in real life. So, um, anyway, so the German investors asked Manfred, can you hire a team, build an online marketplace, and deploy to production at scale within six months? And Manfred said, sure can. So that's when AdScale was formed with the business team in Munich and the software development aspect of the company based in Christchurch. So Manfred took on the role as CTO of AdScale and as anyone involved in a startup knows you have to wear many hats. So he took on HR to recruit the team, he took on the financial controller role to organise all the finance and he took on all the operations. We needed an office. Um, he even recruited people without an office which I think reflects his character. Um, and some of you are here today, <laughs> I see. Um, so that's where we started. And you know, very soon, Manfred had uh, hired a team. But we're quite lucky in that Manfred's experience had taught him that if you want highly performant teams, you need to combine scrum processes with XP practices. And so this has always been a founding premise of AdScale. So we as part of the team, went about adopting Scrum as best we could. Uh, and for us, that meant multidisciplinary teams, as we've heard from Tate. There is so much value to be had in those. It meant stable, self-organizing teams. You need the teams to get to know and learn how to work together with each other. And it also meant three-week iterations. So every three weeks, we would deploy new, production, new functionality to production. And it also meant adopting some really strange practices which initially felt counterintuitive and uncomfortable. Things such as peer programming, two developers sitting in front of one computer to write code together. Uh, collective ownership, that's not your code, it's everyone's code. Uh, Test-driven development, developers writing tests, what a radical idea that is. Uh, constant refactoring, so we were pretty disciplined about uh, implementing these and it certainly wasn't easy. Uh, but if you do it, the benefit is astronomical. You get incredibly high quality product, but it's hard. And so over time, we became performant. And for the business, this meant predictable software delivery. They could know with a 95% certainty that in three weeks' time, they would get what we promised. It meant high quality product. So, you know, as on the video, you know, we've got a team of 30 developers. We deploy to production 
every three weeks, and we've got one CISOP, or one and a half essentially, almost two, um, running this. You know, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and we had flexible, sustainable development. The business can change their strategy at any point they want. It drives us nuts, but it has no material impact to actually building the product. Um, and it results in sustainable development. So nobody gets burnt out doing this. So that was cool. And an interesting thing happened is as we adopted Scrum and worked within Scrum, we found our, actually, our process started evolving itself. So as well as the traditional roles of Scrum Master within the team, we started creating new roles, such as a lead developer, a lead tester that would stay with the story within the sprint to give it some continuity. And these roles could move around ego egolessly. It wasn't a big deal if someone became Scrum Master or had moved about. So there was no um, job titles involved in, or status involved in these things. And we grew. And we grew quickly. So by this time last year, we had uh, grown to three full scrum teams in Christchurch, and we were just starting to develop a fourth scrum team based over in Munich. And we experienced a lot of success. So we were competing directly with Google in Germany. Uh, and for a very brief period, we eclipsed them in reach, which is how many people you get ads in front of. And I've stolen it back since. Um, we serve 300 million ads per day. We host four terabyte of network traffic per day. And last year, our system turned over 23 million euros in 2011. So it works. And it worked for us. And it worked incredibly well. But despite all that success, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. And one of the really interesting things we noticed in having these autonomous self-managing teams is we started getting emergent diversity within the organization. So our scrum boards started all looking different. Um, the teams were adapting the process to suit their needs to build better quality software. We started seeing different approaches occur within the organization. So rather than estimating tasks and points, one team said, we do on average 30 tasks per sprint. Let's just count tasks instead. Um, we saw diagramming emerge where sto story tasks were moved off the scrum board and onto a diagram to give it some context as how everything fits together. And then we also saw some really distinct team identities emerge. Um, and each of our teams are quite unique in that they're like a different country. Um, and that is kind of to me almost logical in that if you've got a different set of people with a different set of skills and a different set of experiences, and you put them in an environment which they can control, you'll get a different culture emerge. And that's certainly what we see with an ad scale. But despite all these really cool stuff happening uh, within the teams and for the company, we ha also had some dysfunction within the organization. So, and that dysfunction kind of manifested itself as a lack of inter-team coordination. So things that required stuff to happen across teams weren't happening. And that, well, you know, examples of that would be technologies not being upgraded. So, you know, we'd not moved to the latest point release of certain feature or certain um, technologies in our system because that needed coordination across all the teams. Uh, and that was really haphazard, the decision making in that. We have an integration test framework, which is one of those things that affects everyone, but no one owns, and so no one loves it. Um, and it just became this beast that took seven hours to run and annoyed everybody, but no one felt like it was their domain to fix it. And then we also saw techno technology proliferation. So we might have three messaging systems when one might have sufficed. So this time last year, we were at a, a point where we had some pressing issues to address. We had to improve our inter-team coordination. We wanted to make decisions inclusively but efficiently. And then Manfred said, All right, <laughs> I'm not going to be here anymore, so you need to fill my roles as well. So um, the roles he was fulfilling as far as finance and HR and other stuff like that, right, OK, now we've got to look after them ourselves. Um, and then we had a concern as well in that we had this great autonomy and freedom with no structure. And we'd grown this thing with you know, no structure at all, apart from Manfred. It was fantastic. Um, and our concern was as soon as you introduce structure, you reduce freedom. So how are we going to do introduce structure without actually breaking all the good stuff? So we had a choice, really. We could choose to instantiate a traditional management layer or a hierarchy, or we could try something else. So that was our question at the time. And let's presume we decided to do something traditional. So 
I guess we're going to need a new CEO because Manfred's going. So that's normally the responsibility of the board, or I guess in our case, AdScale GM at BH, our parent company. And they're going to probably look for someone who can deliver them some extra value. So maybe let's double our feature delivery. That sounds cool because we can always build more software, can't we? Um, so here we go. And they're going to advertise around. And then someone's going to come along and say, yes, I can do that for you. I'm not sure what they're really going to base that decision on, but it's a good promise and they'll probably get the job. So fantastic. We've got a new CEO. So he's going to come into AdScale and he's going to look around and he's going to see a, a stunning lack of structure within our organisation. And he's going to go, right, how am I going to complete my goals without some help? And I'm going to need to put some management in place to help me achieve what I want to do. Um, and it's going to help if they respect my authority, because it's very much a power over kind of deal in these situations traditionally. So he's going to either, well, he or she will either uh, promote or recruit management, and very quickly we'll have a hierarchy. Hooray! But some funny things happen when you instantiate a hierarchy, when you start managing people. So when you start to manage people, those people lose some freedom or some engagement, and that decisions previously made in the team are now expected to be made by the manager. Um, and they, there's a, a disengagement that happens there as well. So it changes the dynamic in the team, and where previously there was freedom, there was now expectation that decisions are someone else's, but there's also an implicit expectation on the manager that they're going to have to look after everything. So people stop looking after themselves somewhat. They disengage a, a, a little bit. And on the other side of this, there's another dynamic that kind of happens in that because of the implicit power structure here, or explicit power structure, that the CEO has power over these managers and they essentially align to do what they request. So the CEO might look at our organisation and think, wow, this is really weird, they do peer programming, what a waste of time that is. You know, two developers working together. If we get rid of that, we'll write twice as much code. So maybe he'll say, no, nah, no peering. And you know, a good compliant manager will address that and say, yep, fair enough, why not? And I know some developers would love that too. Um, and then maybe there'll be an initial bit of success and an uplift in productivity. Awesome, cool. So it's going to look, OK, how do I continue to improve our productivity? So test-driven development. Why are we doing that? Why are developers spending half their time writing tests? This is crazy. Are the testers not doing their job? So um, maybe the next thing will be no TDD. And sure, we'll, we'll throw that out the window too. And then over time, productivity will drop, quality will drop, the wheels will fall off, we'll start firefighting, and that'll become apparent, and the next request will be fix quality. And so to do that, you know, our good manager will... Uh, instantiate a process called code reviews, which do nothing to improve our quality, but do a lot to slow us down even more. And so there, there are some fundamental things there which for knowledge work-based organisations are quite concerning. So if we look at, at that system, we actually, at least from our perspective, and I'm, I feel like I'm bagging that kind of system, but I think for creative work or knowledge-based work, it's really critical that people have freedom and autonomy to pursue their work. And hierarchies work fine if you want to make burgers really consistently, but if you want to build software, you probably want something different. So our concerns where more structure is going to be less freedom. These structures are really rigid and change resistant. It's going to be, once they're in place, it's really hard to get rid of them. And then you get autocratic decisions made on a reduced data set. So while they appear good decisions based on the information to hand, often you're missing a whole lot of perspectives that would have helped line to be a better decision. And often processes replace practices. And we find if you want really high quality software, you should be doing practices and disciplines like TDD and peer programming rather than having instructions on how to write good code. So that was where we were at. And you know, so our decision was, right, OK, let's try something else. And for us, the something else was to try a thing called dynamic governance. So if we bring that back to the team, so the teams are fine. The teams work incredibly well, and they're self-organising. They um, look after uh, coordinating leave, so the team's there to be able to um, deliver a sprint. Um, they look after you know, pretty well everything on a team-based level that affects the team. Uh, they even look after recruitment. The teams decide who gets hired into their team. Um, so what we want to do is you know, take that 
group of peers of equals and apply those principles, those agile principles throughout the organisation. And if you look at our teams, they're, they're very cross-functional, much like um, what was just referred to by Tate's presentation. And you get such a better perspective on what's going on. And it's, it's almost like, you know, if you went to the Serengeti and asked the gamekeeper, where are the zebras? He's not going to go, well, we keep the zebras over here, and we keep the uh, birds over here, and we keep the reptiles over here. Now, we actually need ecosystems to be sustainable to get a better result. Now, these skills within the teams are complementary. You know, they help each other achieve a better outcome. So what we want to do is apply those kind of principles throughout the organisation. And one principle of dynamic governance is organising by circles. So what we do is we create a circle that connects these teams together. And a circle has representation from all the teams that fall uh, within it. And for each team, they have two representatives or two links into the circle. And the purpose of the circle is to make decisions that affect all the development teams. So this might be, do we change our continuous integration framework or um, do we change our release process? Because these things affect every team. And this is where we didn't have coordination previously. And a core uh, premise of a circle is it has a purpose. So the purpose of our development circle is to build fantastic software. And every decision within that circle should be aligned to make that happen. And every decision made within the teams within that circle should be aligned with decisions made in the dev circle. Another sort of key uh, principle of it is double linking. So each circle is connected with two links. And the reason for that is based on cybernetics. So if you're going to control a system, you need an equal ability to be able to measure it. And that's something where, I guess, traditional hierarchies fall down. And they're very good at pushing information out, but they're very poor at responding to information coming back the other way. So the idea of having a double link safeguards both the upward and the downward flow of information in the organisation. So if we look at how that works between the teams, we have a lead link who is responsible for looking after the downward flow to make sure the activities in the teams are aligned with the decisions made in the dev circle. And you have a rep link, which is responsible for making sure that the impact of these decisions on the team are reflected back up to the dev circle. So you've got a feedback loop here. Just as in Scrum, you've got feedback loops everywhere. Inside this um, approach, we have feedback loops. And it's quite key how, you know, you might ask, how are these people appointed? So a key, another sort of key principle of dynamic governance is election. So within the team, the rep link is elected. And it's a really nice, transparent process. And the team elects the person they think will best represent them into the dev circle. And within that dev circle, they have equal opportunity to contribute or veto any idea that's being put forward. Uh, and traditionally, the lead link is appointed from the dev circle downwards. But in AdScale's case, we chose that to be an elected role as well. So we have two members representing the interests of that team into the dev circle. Another sort of key point of this is we want decisions by consent. So currently, we have decisions being made by consent within the teams anyway. So you now what the architecture should look like, how are we going to test this, what is the design? All these things are already arrived at by consent within this cross-functional team. So what we want to do is within the dev circle, arrive by consensus at workable solutions that are within every member's tolerance range. And it's really key that is that you know, you're just trying to find something you can live with. It doesn't have to be perfect or complete. It's just got to be you know, worth a try. And if it doesn't work, we can change our mind and try something else. And you really move away from this analysis paralysis you get with a traditional management layer where you're really trying to get it right from the outset. You're trying to factor everything in to make the best decision possible. Here we want fast decisions that are workable. And anyone can object to a decision. We had a, um, a case where we were just trying to decide which technology to upgrade, and it took about three times because there were so many different conflicts around what should be chosen to upgrade for the next sprint. So decisions by consent are really key, but they already happen within our organisation and the teams. And the purpose of the circle, really the work that's driven within it, is purely about resolving tension. So now when we say tension, it's just a sensed gap between what things currently are and what they potentially could be. So if you see something that's crappy or broken, or if you have a better idea, 
you can take it there and it'll get turned into something tangible, some immediate action or some you know, concrete agreement about what we're going to do about it. You know, so for example, me, before I mentioned we had a problem upgrading our technologies. So um, that was brought to the dev circle. An agreement was reached that every sprint we'd book time into the, each team would book time into the sprint to upgrade a single technology, and that single technology would be chosen every three weeks by the dev circle. Um, you know, simple things like that. You know, if CSS, people have concerns about our CSS consistency, then the dev circle creates a role, CSS custodian, and you know that if you've got problems with CSS, go see David, he's got complete authority to make those decisions. In the same way that the dev circle has got complete authority to make all decisions around how we build software. No one else can tell them how to do that. They don't have to get permission to make these decisions. So what happens above the dev circle? Well, we've got a general circle. And then you go, no, you're going to say, you monkey, you've just created a hierarchy. Um, but I think there's quite a sort of important distinction to make here is that in this kind of structure, organizational power is seeded into a process where everyone has an equal voice and an equal opportunity to change the organization. It is not power based on title or status or position in an organization. All decisions are made by consent within these circles and everyone has an equal voice and the CEO or whoever has no greater voice than anyone else. So we have a general circle and the general circle is another level of abstraction where decisions made in this circle affect everyone in the organization. So there we're talking about decisions like HR. Do we adopt birthday leave for our staff? Now it's going to affect productivity, it's going to affect a few things. Those kind of decisions get made there. So HR decisions, finance decisions, how are we going to allocate our budgets? What are we going to spend them on? Are we going to sponsor the software summit? This is a consensual decision made within our general circle. And the general circle has a purpose as well. And for us that's to figure out how best we can serve our people within our organisation and how best to pursue excellence in software development and how best to pursue excellence in governance practices. <laughs> and everything else in the organisation is aligned with those decisions. And then, you know, we're not just about software. We obviously live in a building and we've got accounts and, um, you know, we've got furniture that has to be bought and looked after and stuff. So we created an ops circle, which is to basically just look after all the infrastructure. And the interesting thing about these circles is that they allow people who are interested in these things to participate. So, you know, in our ops circle we have a tester who is interested in that and two hours a week they'll spend their time in the ops circle contributing to making these kind of decisions and you get cross-representation within the, within the organisation. And then beyond that you have a top circle which essentially is the board and again we have this uh, double linking where you have the CEO acting as the downward link of um, you know, transferring the board's wishes to the organisation. But you also have that elected representative again, who could be anyone in the organisation. It could be the cleaner, it could be the accounts lady. You know, anyone can get elected through the system to represent the concerns of the organisation at the board level and have an equal voice in that. So it's quite a different paradigm. And if we look at it from a sort of larger level of abstraction, what we've ended up building is a network where, which much better represents the actual structure in our organisation. And I think if you look at your organisations, you'll find the best people in them are everywhere. They've got fingers in many, many pies. And uh, how do you represent that in the hierarchy? Whoever goes to their job description and says, have I done everything I'm supposed to do in my job today? Nobody does that. Now, whereas here you've got very clear areas you participate in the organisation and very clear roles and responsibilities you fulfil within it. And these can easily shift around between people. And so what we've found in doing this is that a lot of the principles that make Agile so much more beneficial than waterfall approaches to software development equally apply to um, the advantages of or the values behind dynamic governance when compared to a traditional hierarchical management structure. So rather than a top-down approach, you've got a bottom-up approach. Rather than trying to figure out what would be an ideal and complete product we need to build, we just try and start out with something that's workable and sufficient. Now, rather than having silos where 
You know, we're very Darwinian about how we group people. We say, right, all the developers are here and all the testers are here and you know, very silo-based companies. We get ecosystems which give a much better and richer feedback and perspective on the decisions we make within the company. And rather than having lots of documentation, you have conversation, but you have really clear pathways of conversation. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a real advantage. And I guess you know, one of the things I see in organisations is I, I think there might be a correlation by, between how unclear authority is in your organisation and how much email you receive every morning. Because <laughs> you, you're being copied in onto something because you might need to know or you might have an opinion that might be important at some point. You know, therefore, you drown in this you know, tidal wave of information because someone's concerned that if they don't get your buy-in, you know, there may be repercussions. But that comes down to a, a, an unclear authority to make a decision. No one within these structures knows who has the authority to make that decision. Whereas with dynamic governance, it's really clear who has the authority to make that decision. So we see a whole lot of common patterns and values appearing inside our organisation that appeared within Waterfall. And I guess the, the real question is, OK, fine, you know, you know it's your crazy stuff. Um, but does it work? And from our experience, it does work. And a year ago, we did the JRA Conexa uh, Industry Survey Awards. And at the time, they rate engagement. And the engagement of our staff ran at 50%, which I think is twice the average. So it was already great. Um, and we retook that survey in August. So this is a year where we've had Manfred leave. We've had massive structural change put on the organization. We've had earthquakes. Um, and over that time, when we retook the survey, our engagement has raised to 70% within the organisation. So normally doing that kind of dramatic, um, disruptive change within an organisation really pisses people off. Um, you know, no one likes massive restructures or anything like that. Whereas here, we've actually ended up with a better result from doing these things. Um, yeah, we have very clear authority within the organisation. We knew, know where decisions are made and who is responsible for making them. We're upgrading technologies. We've upgraded 13 technologies, hooray, in our product over the past year. So, you know, things are clearly starting to work and we've got a clear structure in place to allow us to improve the organisation. And, you know, I guess, while I, and I see Agile making the, you know, the reaching your destination faster via Agile. I mean, that certainly works. And I see here, Dynamic governance also allows you to reach your destination faster. But I think the key difference with these two things is not so much the destination, but the journey along the way is so much more enjoyable. It's, you know, it's, it's really engaging to be able to contribute and change your organisation in the way you see fit and have a really clear way to do that and have an equal opportunity to do that as anyone else in the company. So you know, we've found some amazing benefits for that. And I think that's probably about my time. So. Thank you very much. Uh, I understand that agile is a is a road. It's a journey going from one end to the other, or or if there is an, an end to it. I guess I'm just wondering what your ch current challenge is at the moment, because I know that you just keep having them um, and you overcome them and you move on to the next one. Sure. Um, I think, I mean, you know, just as adopting Agile isn't easy. You know, there are some really hard things you have to do. There's some very painful transparency that occurs when you start doing these things in a disciplined way. Um, adopting this is not easy either. There's some pretty disciplined processes behind it. There's some rigorous meeting structures which people hate, but they hate them because it makes them shut up sometimes <laughs> and you know, moves things forward. And you know, it, while it might not be their idea, it is a workable idea. Um, so facilitating the meetings is really hard. You know, there's a very clear structure to it. But it's you know, like Agile or Scrum, the learning curve's pretty steep, and you're asking people to unlearn a whole bunch of stuff. So um, you know, it took us probably about two or three years to get good at Agile. I'd imagine it's going to take us two or three years to get good at this. It's a learning thing. It's, a, it's learning new stuff, but it's unlearning a whole bunch of stuff as well. Thank 
Thanks very much, Scott. Thanks, Damien. It was great. Cheers. Good. Thanks.